Dr. Anthony Chafee, welcome to my podcast. You're very welcome. Thank you uh, for having me on. Yeah, it's very exciting for me um, that you're here. As I said before, I have followed you for a number of years because you are a neurosurgeon and I did initially have some uh, neurological issues. So it was really interesting for me to follow your profile. Um, in terms of the interview, I would first like to focus on your background. So who is Dr. Anthony Chafee and uh, where does your story begin? Oh, well, um, so I'm, a, I'm an American uh, medical doctor, physician. I work currently down in Australia. I'm a neurosurgical resident down here. And I also have a private practice in functional medicine and metabolic health. So focusing on preventative medicine, metabolic medicine, addressing root cause issues as opposed to just papering over symptoms with drugs and things like that, actually trying to get people better, which is, I think, what most people want to do when they get into medicine. I have a particular interest in nutrition and how that affects health and chronic disease, because I think that's one of the most important tools that we have as physicians to heal our patients and get them better from a root cause point of view. We're the only animal that is as sick as we are. All life on earth is extremely healthy. And for some reason, we're just getting sicker and sicker and sicker as we go. And we don't seem to know why that is. Well, I think that's entirely to do with eating the wrong thing and living outside of our biological design. And so I've studied mm -hmm. diet, nutrition, how that affects health and chronic disease for uh, nearly 25 years now. And I think that that is a major, major culprit. And when I apply these principles and start having people uh, in my patient population eat a more species-specific diet, a biologically appropriate diet, a diet that humans have been eating since we've been humans and before, that uh, people get better. And a lot of their underlying health issues resolve all on their own. And all these idiopathic diseases that we learn about and have complicated uh, names and acronyms for so that we can remember them and regurgitate them on board exams as um, you know, aspiring doctors. A lot of these things, we have no idea why they're caused by, we have no idea where they come from. We just sort of see them sometimes. We don't know why, or we don't know how to treat them. You just give them steroids or give them some sort of biological agent or do something to try to suppress the symptoms and, uh, and just hope for the best. And people only get worse and they always get uh, worse from a combination of the disease as well as the medications that are that are treating the symptoms of the disease. And I think the large majority of these come from just eating an inappropriate diet. And you put people on an appropriate diet, they just go away. All these little sort of things that you wouldn't you would have no idea would be from eating the wrong thing, all of a sudden they clear up and people start having their vision improve. They're like, yeah, my my prescription started to lessen. I don't need glasses anymore. You know, their diabetes goes away, their autoimmunity goes away, their uh, other sorts of issues, people's Alzheimer's start improving, their mental health starts improving, uh, all these different things that we just took for granted as part of life. And just sometimes you get these things and it sucks and here's some medicine for it, but it's never going to go away. They go away. And so this is something, I've, this is the drum I've been banging for a number of years now because it is such a massive tool in the doctor's arsenal. And, um, and uh, something that people don't need doctors for. If we just educate people and sort of see what we can eat biologically, these problems largely go away. And we, need, and we only need doctors to do what only doctors can do, which are the traumas and surgeries and these sorts of acute emergencies that, uh, that the medical establishment was, was uh, founded in, for in the first place, which is dealing with these sorts of acute issues that uh, we don't have treatments for. So that's what I want to do. I want to try to get people as healthy as possible so that they don't need me. They don't need doctors in general, or, you know, if they, they only need things, if there's some sort of emergency, like a trauma or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned things that the doctors have nothing to do with. I think those are very uncommon words for a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I am also wondering, um, where did the interest in diet come from for you? So I was interested in in diet and nutrition just for myself. I wanted to be healthy, and I, I understood that nutrition was a big part of that. And that's something that we've all grown up understanding, but we've just been told it was the, the wrong thing. We were told that it was a very different um, – there was a different way of getting getting optimal health. I also was an athlete. I played 
uh, rugby. I played, I did MMA uh, since I was 14 years old and I uh, wanted to be as healthy as I possibly could. I was an all American rugby player. I played at you know, all the highest levels in, in U S and North America, Canada and Europe and, um, and uh, internationally for the U19 um, USA national team. And so that was something that was very important to me was trying to give my body the right nutrition and understand what that was, but also because of, of medicine, I was just interested in that. And I just sort of thought like, okay, this is part of that. You shouldn't understand nutrition. You shouldn't understand how the body works and what we're supposed to be fed so that we understand how the body can work normally. And then obviously you help the problems, uh, you know, the abnormalities that come around. You can't fix what's normal if you don't know what's normal first. You can't even recognize what's abnormal if you don't know what's normal first. So I was learning traditional nutrition. This is the way it's always taught in, in universities. You want to be in these different uh, amounts of macros and micros and all these other sorts of things. You try to learn all those different um you know, paradigms and just regurgitate them for a test. And you don't, you don't know any reason why not to trust them. Um, but then I was taking cancer biology back in my undergraduate degree. And my professor was actually going on about how toxic plants were and how they used uh, poisons to defend themselves. And this is you know, because they're stationary, they're living organisms though, and they like to stay living organisms. And if you eat them, they die. And so it's like all life on earth, everything has a defense. Everything tries to stop you from eating them. But while animals can run away or fight back, plants can't. So they need to use other methods. And they have about a million different chemicals that they make that are there to poison, kill, or derange somebody's health or or, or even just um, uh, like latex where they secrete this very sticky, tacky sap called latex. And, um, and it actually glues the mouth shut of animals trying to eat it. And so it's a pretty elegant way to stop an animal from eating you is to glue its mouth shut. Um, but you know, that saves the, the plant, but the animal generally dies because they can't get their mouth unstuck and they starve to death over the course of a few weeks or get eaten by something. So plants are more than happy for you to die if they get to live. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's something that we need to remember. And so these toxins, uh, are toxic and they can cause sub lethal harm over years and decades. It's like smoking, just like drinking. It doesn't necessarily kill you overnight. But over the years, over the decades, it builds up and slowly damages your health and, and other toxins and plants can do that as well. And so we were looking at this from a cancer point of view. So we were looking at carcinogens. And so he said that uh, there were 136 known carcinogens just in Brussels sprouts and over 100 in mushrooms and over 60, over 80 in, in beans and legumes and spinach and broccoli and kale and cabbage and cucumbers and all the different fruits and vegetables that we would all eat as a normal, balanced, healthy diet, right? And so I'd already taken biology, I'd already taken botany, I already sort of knew some of these core concepts, but it was still shocking to me because you learn that animals and animals and, and plants are in a evolutionary arms race, plants becoming more and more toxic so less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive and animals becoming more adapted to specific animals, specific, specific poisons and specific plants so they can eat that plant and survive and thrive. Um, and that's their evolutionary niche as well. You learn all that and then you forget that that applies to humans as well and that animals need to eat specific diets um, and that we're animals. We always forget that. So that yeah, made I sense to me, but I was still definitely. shocked by that. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I just said, yeah, I think we do definitely a lot of people think we're just like a different species, not animals. Mm. Whereas, you know, carnival diet teaches you that it's, that's it. Yeah. Well, like we just came from space or something like that. And we're just not, um, you know, we're just not beholden to the, the physical laws of nature, but of course we are. And um, so, yeah, so I was, I was very taken aback by that, but it, it, I sort of got it, but I remember thinking in my head, I was like, what, what, Vegetables are still good for you though, right? And I remember him uh, just sort of giving us a funny look and uh, just sort of looking at us and he just said, yeah, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. And I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. And so I said, right, okay, you know, that's, that's very clear. I'm just not gonna eat any plants. 
And so I just stopped eating plants at that point. I just felt, I've never felt better in my entire life. I defaulted into a carnivore diet. I wasn't doing that because it was ancestrally appropriate because we've been doing this for millions of years and that's what we're biologically adapted for. I was just not going to eat plants uh, because that was a, that was a very convincing uh, lecture. And so I went and, and went through and the grocery store and everything had plants in it. And I was just completely confused. What the hell do I eat then? Um, and there was, you know, just eggs and meat. And that was the only thing I could find that didn't come from plants. So that's what I just ate by default. And I never felt better in my entire life. I was playing better. I was uh, a better student. I, it was so much easier to uh, get in shape, stay in shape. My athletic performance just went through the roof. I got in a, a, extremely good shape. And I just kept going and going and going. And I was extremely um, uh, benefited by this. I was extremely healthy. I used to get colds every month. Now I never got sick. I never got sick in that whole period. And um, I would get pneumonia once or twice a year uh, because I was in Seattle and it's bloody freezing. I'm out in the, you know, iced rain playing rugby in short shorts. And it's just like, you know, this is, it was just miserable. And I was just sick all the time. And I would get pneumonia, you know, a couple of times a year. Even in, in San Diego, I get pneumonia a couple of times a year, except for that five year period that I was a carnivore. I never got sick. I certainly never got pneumonia. And then I slipped off of it because I wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize how significant what I was doing was. And I just went back to sort of eating whole food, mostly meat, some vegetables or a salad and uh, maybe some bread sometimes, but I hardly ever had bread or pasta or anything like that. It was mostly just meat and some salad because I was, you're supposed to eat salad apparently. And so I just ate that and I never felt as good. And I wasn't able to stay in as good of shape. I wasn't able to to play as well as I normally would. I wasn't able to just go athletically as hard as I wanted to, just as long as I wanted to, or, or as I could before. And then at 38, I came across information showing that, no, humans really are just carnivores. That's just the kind of animal we are. And that's what I was doing for five years. I was living as a carnivore. I was eating as we're supposed to. And it said, right, that's it. That makes sense. And I said, right, I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me, get rid of these stupid things. And I just stopped eating all vegetables. I was already not eating carbs. And I started eating a lot more fatty meat. And by increasing the amount of fatty meat I ate and getting rid of the plants, I lost 23 pounds in 10 days. That's 10 kilos in 10 days. And I've just felt absolutely incredible. And I went back to start and started playing high level rugby with my team in Seattle that had just gone fully professional. Um, in the major league rugby uh, circuit in America. And I just felt absolutely fantastic. And I was able to keep up with everybody. It was mid season and I was able to hit the ground running, even though I was completely out of shape and I just come back from uh, humanitarian work in Bangladesh. I wasn't exercising at all. And I, I just felt amazing. I was at a dead sprint the whole time. I could push myself like I was 22 again. And um, it was like, it was like I'd never stopped playing from when I was, when I was uh, 22 and I just felt amazing. So it, um, that really interested me. And I started thinking of things as a doctor and looking at, at the health and the state of hum humanity and realizing that we were carnivores as a species, but we weren't eating as such. And what any zookeeper will tell you, if an animal eats what it doesn't eat in the wild, what it didn't evolve on, it gets very, very sick. And, um, you know, this is why there are signs at the zoo that say, um, and they say, don't feed the animals. It makes them very sick if you uh, feed them something that they they don't normally eat. And we forget that we're animals as well. And so when you think about that from a medical perspective, it's, um, you know, things start slotting into place. And I started thinking that, that a lot of these chronic diseases were largely to do with, with um, the just eating an inappropriate diet. Good. So there is just one thing that I wanted to focus on in terms of uh, coming back to the interview after the technical break. Um, so mm -hmm. one thing you mentioned is when you were in, when you got interested in the diet, you were actually an athlete. So when mm -hmm. I went on the carnival diet, I tried to understand what type of people are interested and what type of people aren't interested in that diet, mostly because it was such an epiphany for me. And when I went on this diet, I have never felt better. And I tried to share it with other people and nobody was interested. Um, so <laughs> right now I can just see that it's either people who had some health problems and wanted to improve 
or people who already had good health, like athletes, but just wanted to optimize their performance. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good uh, that's a good breakdown. Most people, I mean, that's their motivation, right? You know, some people just aren't motivated because they they feel like, okay, yeah, I feel fine. I don't think I have an issue. I enjoy my life. I enjoy having some drinks every now and then, and you know, eating the way I eat. And I you know, I don't feel like I have any problems, so I don't need to change anything. Um, what I usually point out to people in that circumstance is that you don't even realize how bad you feel because you've never seen the contrast. You've never gotten rid of these things to realize just how much better you would feel when you get rid of them. And some people, that, that can intrigue people sometimes, and they think like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And um, and then they give it a try, and they're like, yeah, I had no idea that you could actually feel like that. Um, but uh, And then the other ones, too, is just, yeah, athletes or just other people trying to optimize their health. So I, actually, a lot of my followers and people that that subscribe to me on YouTube are were former vegans and vegetarians who had that same mindset. They say, hey, I just want to be as healthy as I can be. And they got sucked into the whole plant-based ideology that this is the best way to eat and that this is the healthiest way to eat. And so they believed that for a long time and they show they're eating that way. And of course, at first, there's a sunny moon period of where they, they felt better than they did before because they cut out all the junk food and the garbage and they're eating more whole foods. Um, and then, you know, maybe they didn't actually think like, oh, okay, well, maybe I don't feel as well as I could. Like, okay, well, might as well try. And as soon as they start eating meat and they cut out plants, they feel remarkably better. And so that's the sort of thing. Yeah, people that are that are consciously interested in their health and improving their health, they might get interested in saying, okay, well, that makes sense. Certainly athletes that are trying to get an edge, some athletes are very scared of it. They say like, oh, don't I need carbs? Don't I need this? Don't I need that? Um, and they can get very worried about that because they don't want to rock the boat because right now what's, what's, what they're doing is working for them and they don't want to, they don't want to mess with that. And that's understandable. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're brave enough to take that jump, you know, no risk, no reward. And so some of these people are going and trying it and they're top athletes already. And then they become elite world-class athletes. And um, that's like a friend of mine, Ryan Talbot, did that. He was already a, a scholarship track athlete at Michigan State. You know, it's a Division One university in America. And he switched to carnivore, and he instantly slammed up his performance and started just absolutely killing it. And his testosterone jumped from like 760 to 1150 in a year. I mean, imagine that, about what that's going to do. I mean, a lot of people cheat and try to... Um, you know, take performance enhancing drugs to, to get that sort of a benefit or even not even that much of a benefit to try to perform, increase their athletic performance. And he just got it naturally from changing his food. So that's a huge, huge, huge benefit. And of course, all the other hormones, all these other sorts of energy dynamics uh, improved as well as a result of that. Um, so, you know, he went from, from being, you know, a, a great athlete to then winning the big 12 decathlete decathlon. Uh, setting a school record in his second ever decathlon and uh, becoming an All-American. Now he's a two-time All-American. He got gold, or sorry, um, bronze medal in the Pan Am Games representing America uh, in the decathlon. And now he's been invited to try out for the Olympics for the USA team. So, you know, it, it just absolutely catapulted his performance. And he's already a fantastic athlete and his, his work ethic was all there. So mentally he was just in a very prime position to really get the most out of this. But as he said, the diet is what turned him into the athlete he, he's always wanted to become. And now he's reaping the benefits of that. And hopefully we'll see him in the next, uh, next Olympics, if not this next one, then the one after. So I will be playing the devil's advocate here a little bit, even though obviously I'm kind of on myself. Um, you speak a lot about plants being bad for humans, but are plants like the worst thing out of everything that exists that a person could be eating? Um, well, I mean, it depends on the plant, I guess. I mean, you know, half a leaf of hemlock will kill you. So that's a pretty bad plant. Um, so plants in general, yeah, plants in general are, are extremely toxic. Plants make a million different defense chemicals that are designed to harm you and designed to stop you from eating them. So, uh, yeah, most plants will actually kill you. If you get lost in the woods and you run out of food, you can't eat any random plant, right? Because most of them make you very sick or even kill you. So those plants certainly are, yes, the, like some of the worst things that you can eat. Um, 
the so-called edible plants that we eat, are they the worst things ever? It depends because some of them are only edible because we treat them chemically or with heat or some other sort of uh, productive means that we uh, can detoxify them. You know, the lectins that are in beans can kill you. Um, just five kidney beans, red kidney beans, uh, uncooked or undercooked can have put people in the hospital. And that's according to the WHO and the CDC. Um, there was a, a rash, an outbreak of illness because in Japan, there was a cooking show where they taught, they were telling people how to cook these, whatever beans, I forget which kind. And uh, so many people did the recipe wrong that over a thousand people got very sick and hundreds of people had to go to the hospital with lectin poisoning. So, you know, it's actually quite harmful. So it's not that, uh, you know, you're, you're going to eat in a piece of asparagus and you're going to die. The problem is, is that they have these toxins. Some of them can be very low grade, some of them high grade. And if you don't prepare them properly, you can be in trouble. Cassava, which is the number one uh, calorie source for 750 million people in the tropics, uh, that can kill you. If it's not treated properly, that has so much cyanide in it, it will kill you. But low grade exposure to cyanide, sublethal exposure to cyanide, long term can cause multi organ failure, thyroid damage, neurological dysfunction, and many, many other health issues. And there's so many health issues that are just grumbling around. We just don't feel good. Our thyroids aren't really working well. We're getting weird aches and pains, brain fog, all these sorts of things can absolutely come as a direct result of these, of these uh, sub lethal doses of plant toxins that are just building up in our system day after day after year year after year after year and just like smoking or drinking doesn't necessarily kill you overnight but over the years over the decades it builds up and causes harm so many plants will just kill you many plants that we eat right now will kill you if not treated properly but the other ones uh, are not safe just because they don't kill you you know, and just because something doesn't give you that acute phase reaction makes you very, very sick or kill you doesn't mean that that's entirely safe and doesn't mean that it's okay to eat this long term. Um, other than that, I mean, you know, mushrooms are really bad. You know, my fungus in general uh, are, are, is very bad. And I mean, I mean, think about it this way, you know, how many mushrooms are there? I mean, there's over 10,000 different varieties of mushroom. How many of those don't kill you on the spot or give you a religious experience? Right. There's not that many. Like some of them will make you very, very sick, give make you hallucinate profusely or even kill you. And uh, and then we think, well, oh, these ones don't give you that acute phase reaction. Therefore, they're not only safe, but good for you, which I think is a very, very uh, dangerous um, game to play with something like that, especially when things have these toxins that we know of. So of the things that we eat, it's really just animal and vegetable. Uh, we're not eating mineral. We're not eating a bunch of rocks, hopefully. Um, unless you're very iron deficient, then then pregnant women sometimes eat dirt to try to get some iron because they're just not eating enough meat. And um, so, you know, that's really that's really the two options is meat, plants, fungi. Um, those are the main the main options there. And of of those three options, the plants and the fungi are extremely toxic, yes. Some so, so you don't get used to poison, basically, because this is what I hear all the time. I am on the lion diet and I cannot tolerate plants if I even if I wanted to. And people tell me if you eat a low dose of a plant every single day, you're just going to get used to it. You can you can um, build up a tolerance, you know, just like you would with alcohol and you can have more alcohol. You can have more, you know, magic mushrooms and, and then you won't have as much of a reaction to the drug, that harmful chemical that's in that 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 mushroom. And you don't get as much of a hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic reaction. So you have to eat more and more and more of these if you want the same hallucinogenic reaction. And so, yes, that's true. You build up a tolerance to these sorts of things, but it doesn't mean you become immune to them. Um, and it doesn't mean that that it's good for you. It doesn't mean that that's not harming you, even though you've built up a tolerance to it. Um, there was a oh, was like the king of oh, who was it, Mithridates or something like that. Oh, I'm gonna I'm not gonna remember that properly. But anyway, he was he was an ancient Greek king. Uh, he pissed off the Romans, and um, he uh, ended up getting the Romans coming back at him. He had spent his life exposing himself to small amounts of hemlock and other poisons so he could build up a tolerance to this. So if someone 
poisoned him, put a bunch of poison in his food, it wouldn't kill him. And so he did, he spent a lot of time building up a tolerance of these toxins. And um, the irony of that was that was that when he pissed off the Romans and he wiped out some, you know, Roman settlement, they came back and just wiped out his entire kingdom and all his cities and then was coming after him. And he's running away from them. And he goes and he's just sort of trapped in his tower at the sort of the end game. He's not going to get out of there. And he's just like, all right, I need to kill myself. So he tried to kill himself with uh, hemlock so he could um, not be tortured by the by the Romans for you know a long time. And uh, he built up such a tolerance that he couldn't kill himself. And so he actually is you know, a bit ironic on that. So, yeah, of course, you can you can build up a tolerance. And that and that is that is what we do. So, you know, if you're on a you know, a carnivore diet for a period of time, you, you don't have the need to build up these tolerances and those tolerances go down. So then you have uh, some of these you know plants in your system again, and it hits you harder. And um, that's also, you're also seeing the contrast. Now you, you like feeling amazing. You like feeling your best. And then all of a sudden you don't feel your best. You're like, don't like that. And so the contrast is more clear, but yes, you can have uh, that tolerance can go away as well. So it can actually you know, hit you a bit harder. Uh, but that's, that's, you know, just because you can, you know, we, <laughs> excuse me, if, you know, if they're saying that they're admitting these things are poisons, they're saying, yeah, it's a poison, but you know, just build it up. It's okay. It's fine. You know, you'll be fine. I mean, that's like saying just drink every day and then you won't, you know, you'll have a tolerance for it and then you won't get drunk. So you can go to school, you can drink a bunch of alcohol when you go to school and you won't be drunk and you can drive and it's totally fine. I was like, why, why would you want to? Like, why would you want to expose yourself to poison, even if you build up a tolerance towards it? It's not good for you. It's not doing you any benefit. Um, you know, so, I mean, what what is the point of that? So it's a bit funny uh, that they're admitting that there's poison, but it's okay because just build up a tolerance to the poison. That's that kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so for me, I noticed, so I used to be in chronic pain. I had 30 migraines a month before I went on the yeah. carnival diet. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I used to have 30 migraines a month. And what happened when I stopped eating all of the inflammatory food? So it wasn't just vegetables, but you know, all of the processed stuff and well, everything else. What happened was my pain went down to zero because it used to be at like level at the level of like five, six a day, and sometimes mm. going up to 10. Um, and then it went down to zero. And then every single time I ate something else, it would go up to 10. So I, I felt like, you know, the kind of variation was just much higher than on the regular diet where I was kind of used to plants, but I was in chronic pain. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, you know, migraines as, as well. I mean, we, you know, people say, oh, there's no, there's no evidence for a carnivore diet. And that's not true. There's tons of evidence for it. There's tons of evidence for, for animal-based diets, high fat meat-based diets like the ketogenic diet we've been using ketogenic diets for 100 years to treat epilepsy and migraines clinically that was the treatment for epilepsy and migraines uh, and diabetes for 100 years um and then you know after several decades we were able to get pharmaceuticals to be able to help that and the people just said yeah yeah just use the drugs it's fine it's easier that way you don't have to talk to them about diet and lifestyle and things like that became very lazy gave doctors an excuse to just be lazy and just say yeah, whatever. Just take the pill. Don't worry about it. Um, mm, okay. Obviously, that's wrong. If you can, if you can fix something without medication, you should. I think it's I think it's your responsibility as a doctor to do that. Um, but you know what? What is a ketogenic diet? You you take out carbohydrates. Okay. Well, what do you replace them with? What are your macros? Protein, fat. Okay, but which protein and fat from vegetables? No, not really. All those all those studies. Uh, replace it with animal fat, animal protein. They replace it with meat. So instead of eating carbohydrates, you're eating meat and you're only eating meat and maybe having a side salad or something like that. So it's a carnivore diet with a side salad, carnivore light, right? Mm -hmm. Or you could do a carnivore diet. It's, they don't distinguish, right? It's just don't eat carbs. It doesn't say you have to eat salads. It just means you can't eat carbs. And so that actually is the most rigorously studied diet in medicine, having specific discrete medical outcomes saying, hey, what works? What is getting a, a good benefit, a good medical outcome? And the best medical outcomes that we found, the most rigorously studied diet, the most efficacious study that we've ever uh, diet that we've ever studied um, has been an animal based diet, a whole food, high fat animal based diet, uh, which is the ketogenic diet. So carnivore light. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, and uh, you also pay a price if you take medication. So I used to be on mm -hmm. anti-epileptic medications, Topiramat, if you know, 
I'm not sure mm-hmm. how you pronounce that. Yeah, that one. So I used to be on that one. It didn't actually work for the migraines and it also gave me severe depression. So I feel like, you know, even if it works, you get depression instead of migraines. It's just, you know, it doesn't really make you that happy, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I definitely have to worry about the side effects. And, you know, as, as uh, one doctor said, um, you know, there's no, there's no such thing as side effects. There's just effects. These drugs have effects and some of them you want, some of them you don't want. And so, uh, yeah, but they they can have very nasty effects. Yes, but in terms of other people, so I was just thinking because it's so unbelievable for, you know, people who are not on this diet, that something that they don't feel the effect of immediately, such as spinach, could actually have a bad impact on their health. And I was thinking about this and I actually listened to another podcast that you were on. And on that podcast, you speak about animals and how they are, Uh, they have an evolutionary diet and if there is any deviation from that they get very very sick so i was just wondering if you could elaborate on that yeah so i mean all animals are are of this nature so they uh all animals have this biologically appropriate species specific diet you know zookeepers will tell you that if you feed an animal something that doesn't eat in the wild uh something that's not biologically adapted for it gets very sick but what does it get sick with? It gets so BC, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, liver disease, liver, you know, liver failure, autoimmune diseases, arthritis, and, and uh, all the rest of them. So that's why there are signs that they just say don't feed the animals. It makes them very sick if they don't eat uh, what they're designed to eat. And uh, you know, saying don't feed the animals the thing that you're eating right now. You know, maybe that should make us th- think. It, says it makes them sick. But what is it doing to us? You know, so... Um, if, if animals don't eat what they're designed to eat, they get sick and people don't realize that, you know, we, we are animals too. And that that applies to us. Mm -hmm. If you want to study nutrition, the last thing you want to do is study nutritional studies, because most of those are put forward by special interests, people with uh, an ideological bent, like a religious bent. There's a massive religious movement in the seventh day Adventist church since the 1800s has been pushing uh, a plant-based diet because they felt that it caused lustful feelings and lust and lust is a sin. So they've been pushing this. Dr. Kellogg's, who founded Kellogg cereals with his brother, um, was of this mindset and he founded Kellogg cereals in order to replace meat with plant-based alternatives to suppress sexual urges, lust, and masturbation. And so then the Seventh-day Adventist Church founded about 20 different Cereal companies now you have this monster that's grown out. They founded and started the processed food industry, which is now a multi-trillion dollar industry. And now, A, they have an ideological bent in the Seventh-day Adventists. They're the ones who put out the Blue Zone studies, which are not studies. They're just propaganda. They've lied about how much uh, plants these people were eating, how much meat they were eating, and and even how long they lived because that was not actually um, verified. They just – there was all self-reported, and they actually – found that that none of these people that a lot of these people were not nearly as old as they thought as they said they were um and so um you know this is this is just pushing an ideology but now it's also pushing um a a profit agenda profit driven agenda the vast majority of nutritional studies are paid for by the the food companies so like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Nestle and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, these ones that do the, the, the most amount of nutritional research, spend the most amount of money. Coca-Cola alone spends 11 times the amount of money on nutritional research than the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, right? So the vast majority of studies out there in nutrition are basically just propaganda pieces. They're part of their marketing budget to try to push their product. So if you want to study nutrition, don't study that, Right. What you should study is biology, physiology, and uh, evolutionary biology. What did our species eat? What do our species eat? You know, there aren't any studies. I mean, vets aren't so dumb that they say like, hmm, you know, what does a badger eat? Maybe I should do a study and, you know, and do this sort of thing and, and, and do a survey and sort of see all this sort of nonsense. No, you know what they do? They go out in the wild and they look at and see what badgers eat. They study them. They observe them. Well, observation is the lowest form of evidence. You know what? But it's actually describing reality. And so if you actually see what happens in the real world and see what the real world results are, that actually is meaningful. And so if you do that for animals, then you know what animals are supposed to eat. They don't do any other sort of studies because they would be stupid to do. Um, 
you feed them that in the zoo and they're going to be healthy. You feed them outside of that, they get sick. Very simple. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing goes for us. You look at what humans eat in the wild when they're healthy. You look with what they eat when they can't. If they're, if they're in the wild, they generally eat meat. Traditionally, we ate meat. The Inuit eat meat. During the Ice Ages, we could only eat meat. There wasn't anything else to eat. And, um, you know, this is something that evolutionary biologists and, and archaeologists, paleoanthropologists say. The reason that we are human is because our ancestors became carnivores. It's not we didn't turn carnivore. Our ancestors were carnivore millions of years before Homo sapiens even existed. We're homo sapiens because our ancestors were carnivores and that drove our evolution until our, our current iteration. And immediately after agriculture, the height and health of the people declined. Our brain size declined by 11% for men and 17% for women immediately after um, agriculture. And this happened all over the world at different areas. So it wasn't just like all around the world, our brain sizes went down. No, it was only in those areas that switched to agriculture. And then in Native Americans, the Native Australians, we saw this happen in real time. Uh, about a century, century and a half ago, they were sort of forcibly switched onto a more Western diet from really just a meat only diet uh, or meat predominant diet. And they be they shrank, they're shorter, they have much more health issues and they are plagued with these chronic diseases. So that's obviously not what we're designed for. Whatever we're eating now, whatever we're doing now is wrong because our natural state of humanity is that of health. The natural state of all life on earth is that of health. And yet we're sick as hell. We're the fattest and sickest that we've ever been in our, in our existence. So obviously that's not right. And so if you look at what humans have been eating for millions of years, it's meat. And we've been eating plants basically because we've had to or use them as drugs. And sometimes we get addicted to them as drugs like you know, carbs and sugar and things like that can potentially uh, be addictive in nature. And so that's what you want to avoid. What you want to do is you want to eat what humans are designed to eat, what we've been eating throughout our entire existence. And that's what's going to be healthiest for us is immutable, the immutable law of biology is that of adaptation. Life adapts to pressure or it dies. That's all it is to it, all there is to it. So we adapt to that and our species adapts to that or our species goes extinct. Well, our species didn't go extinct. The more plant-based early humans, uh, when the ice ages came around two, two and a half million years ago, they all died out. The only ones that survived were the ones that were pretty much carnivore and now they'd be able to survive as apex predators and manifest our destiny as apex predators, hunt down mammoths, hunt down these giant megafauna and go up into the ice. They didn't run away from it. They didn't go towards the equator. They went up into the ice. Homo habilis went up into the ice and went after these big, big uh, prey animals up in the ice. And that's what turned us into human. Those were the ones that survived. We're descended from the survivors. You can't be descended from the, from the losers. It doesn't work like that. They're dead. So that's what we are. And so we've been adapted to meat for millions and millions and millions of years. We've been apex predators for millions and millions of years. It was only 10,000 years ago that some populations switched over to agriculture and that dramatically damaged our health. And then more recently, native populations in, in the Americas and Australia switched over to agriculture forcibly, generally, and that significantly damaged their health. The, the native Australians, when I first came to Australia to practice medicine, I was told day one that if you have an Aboriginal patient whatever their age says, just add 20 years to that because they just age so much faster and they just break down. They get diseases that you wouldn't expect in someone their age that they would expect them to something 20 years down the line. Well, that's because they haven't had 10,000 years to adapt to uh, this, these plant toxins and, and uh, malnutrition that we're getting from not eating enough meat and eating a bunch of nasty ass plants. And so uh, they are getting hit a lot harder than we are. So they have a much higher rate of chronic disease. We still get chronic disease. It's not like we're, we're immune to this stuff. It's just they are more sensitive to it. And so that's what you need to study. If you want to know about nutrition, you study biology, you study evolutionary biology, and you just observe what do people do in the wild? You know, what do we watch when these survivor shows? Um, you know, when you, uh, you know, like that show alone, you know, where you, you stick them out in the middle of Alaska or, or Siberia or something like that. And you just say, okay, you know, call us when you're, you're about to die, you know? So, um, you know, people just live out there and they try to survive out in the wild 
And what do they eat? They're not eating leaves and roots and tubers. They, they go, they're, they're hunting, they're fishing, they're eating meat. So that's what you have to do. You know, that's what you're, I mean, if they know what plants to eat, maybe they will if they're starving, but in all of those, all of those shows, they all focus on meat. They prioritize meat, they prioritize fat. And so that's what we should do as well. When you speak about chronic diseases, they are so different from one another. I mean, what does arthritis have to do with a stroke or with a migraine? Mm -hmm. How is it possible that they can all come from the same thing? Well, they can come from a lot of different things. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, a stroke when you and um, and arthritis, arthritis can come from inflammation and damage uh, to the articular cartilage, say in your knee. There are studies showing that that inflammation and damage can be in, increased by glycation, which is high blood sugar. So that's why diabetics have all these different diseases that they can get. They're much more likely to get. Uh, heart disease and strokes and and uh, arthritis and all these sorts of things. That's because high blood sugar is directly damaging to your body. It's very toxic to your body. Um, mm -hmm. So your body needs to tightly regulate it under a certain threshold. And so when you have high blood sugars, it gets what's called glycation. Well, it's actually happening all the time anyway. And then you have to keep it under a certain level so you can sort of uh, keep it under control, the damage under control. But those glucose molecules, little rings, they physically fuse to other molecules. And that's called glycation. It permanently damages them and, and, and forms AGEs, advanced glycation end products. And so you see a lot of these AGEs, you see a lot of this damage from glycation in the articular cartilage, cartilage in, in your joints. And so they've seen this in knee joints, they've seen this in other joints, and uh, and this is this precipitates arthritis. This is why you don't see arthritis in skeletons prior to the agriculture, and then you do after agriculture. Um, obviously there's inflammatory forms of arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, and that's an autoimmune disease from these plant toxins that are coming in and they're sticking onto your body and your body tries to attack them and get rid of them. And your body's getting hit in the crossfire. If you just get rid of all these plants, you get rid of those plant toxins. Your body doesn't need to attack them. Your antibodies come right down. So how does this work in stroke? Well, there are many different kinds of stroke, but heart disease in general, uh, can be precipitated by high blood sugar that high blood sugar again is causing glycation damages your ldl knocks off your apple b100 receptor now it can't be taken in by your liver your macrophages suck those up uh, you make these big foam cells people think that's part of the relationship between atherosclerosis but if it if it were it's not the cholesterol's fault it's the carbohydrates fault um, i'm not convinced that that is actually at fault either but either way it's not the cholesterol's fault it's something else that's damaging cholesterol and that's being used in that process if that's it and that's never been proven um you get damage to your artery walls you get again inflammation you get malnutrition you get homocysteine goes up too high and that damages the inside of your artery lining if you have high b12 and folate that suppresses um that suppresses homocysteine so if you're not eating enough meat you won't get b12 because b12 you can only get from meat and so your homocysteine can be up and you're going to start damaging the inside lining of your of your arteries um, and then you start building up this plaque and you get this clot and this breakdown and, and this clot and scarring and clot and scarring and you sort of thicken up that tissue so that sort of stuff can can damage it nicotine can damage it all these different plant toxins can damage the artery lining and uh, and lead to damage to your your artery uh, walls and that can cause thickening and potentially cause a heart attack or a stroke um, but, you know, that's, again, coming from inflammation. That's coming from eating the wrong thing. That's coming from glycation. Um, different sorts of things like high blood pressure. High blood pressure, again, can be caused by homocysteine. It sort of irritates the arteries and they can sort of contract and they don't, you know, open up uh, wide. So they're, they're, the, the pressure is, is higher because there's a lower volume. But also insulin. So insulin resistant, you're having high blood sugar. Your insulin goes up, as I mentioned earlier. Um, when your insulin is up, it's not just getting your blood sugar down, it's affecting over 100 different processes in your body. And so this causes extreme disruption of your normal physiological mechanisms. Um, one of those is your blood pressure because it now you're, um, you're, you get insulin resistance and now your arteries don't want to expand. So they just stay contracted, right? So you have, this, and again, a contracted system and you have high blood pressure. You have prolonged high blood pressure, you can get a, a burst vessel, you get a hemorrhagic stroke. So uh, insulin will also affect all these other sorts of things such as autophagy, it suppresses autophagy. 
autophagy is when you replace out different organelles inside your cells and uh, or you know get rid of these zombie cells and these things that are just sort of half dead um i, I you either replace them or regenerate them um and uh you know replacing out your mitochondria your mitochondria run your cells almost like a ship they're going up and down the mass they're pulling on the sails and doing all the, all the work inside the cells to make that cell run and when they start slowing down and breaking down you're not making enough of them you have to replace them and you have to make more of them when your insulin's high it stops that so that's autophagy replacing out those little organelles in there specifically for the mitochondria is called my mitophagy and high insulin suppresses that so you're eating carbohydrates you're eating sugar and you're going to get high insulin that's going to suppress autophagy so now you can't replace out your mitochondria and you can't make more of them so the metabolism of the cell starts to slow down the functioning of the cell start, starts to slow down and that's affecting your tissue that's affecting your brain that's affecting your heart your lungs your kidneys your thyroid your ovaries your testicles all these other sorts of organs and tissues are just slowing down and getting worse you have uh three four months on a ketogenic carnivore diet and you'll have four times the number of mitochondria and they're four times as effective. You don't need to fast to get autophagy. You just need to fast from carbs. Uh, it's not about not eating. It's about not eating carbohydrates so that your insulin comes down. So it's not necessarily one mechanism. However, just raising your blood sugar causes widespread damage in your body. Mm -hmm. And when you raise your blood sugar, because it causes widespread damage to your body, your body needs to try to get rid of that mm -hmm. stuff, raises your insulin, which also causes widespread damage in your body. And, and serious disruption of your physiology. So just that mechanism, high blood sugar, high insulin, causes a lot of chronic disease. And then you add in all the specific plant toxins that can cause specific organ and neurological damage, you know, like, like cyanide. You know, cyanide, you know, damages the mitochondria, stops the electron transport chain, damages the thyroid, causes neurological dysfunction. And this is, this is, uh, very active in, in cassava. Like I said, you know, this is, you know, there's so much cyanide in cassava that it can kill you. And it's set, you know, the staple calorie source for 750 million people in the, in the tropics. And so, you know, these people are relying on this and they're forced to take in, um, you know, these, these clinically significant levels of cyanide and they're getting thyroid dysfunction, they're getting neurological dysfunction and all the rest. So, the specific toxins can cause specific issues and they all build up to have all these sorts of problems, but the, the high blood sugar and the high insulin just on their own can cause a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is basically eating sugar and eating plant toxins will trigger a number of inflammatory responses in your body that is going to lead to, to a number of diseases and they can be different from each other in any human that is eating those toxins. Yeah, I mean, they can be, you know, if, you, if you're eating sort of similar ones, like if you're eating a lot of, you know, uh, carbs and sugar and seed oils and things like that, you're going to start raising your blood sugar, you're going to start raising your insulin, you're going to start getting insulin resistance, and you're going to start getting all these problems from high insulin, from high blood sugar as well. So, and that that'd be quite similar. So, I mean, eventually, you know, uh, you know, everyone has the potential to get diabetes or you can get insulin resistance and insulin affecting specific organs so they're calling um alzheimer's type 3 diabetes now yeah. and that's from insulin resistance of the brain you do a pet scan where you give radio labeled glucose in an injection and you do a ct to see where that glucose goes normally your cortex is going to light up with that um people with alzheimer's don't do that it's just it it's a, it's a significant decrease in glucose uptake uh, went with people with Alzheimer's because it just can't get into the brain. So if you're not getting enough energy into the brain long term, you're going to damage the brain. It's not going to be able to build and maintain itself. It's not going to be able to run sufficiently. Mm -hmm. And um, then you look at PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. That's now being called type four diabetes, insulin resistance of the ovaries. Right. And that's the number one cause of uh, female driven uh, infertility around the world. Um, that comes because insulin blocks the 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 um, transformation of testosterone into estrogen. So women make testosterone first, and that's converted into estrogen. But insulin blocks that, so you block the testosterone going into estrogen. So you get too much testosterone, not enough estrogen. You don't get pregnant. You get hairy back and face, and put on weight. 
So probably not what, what most people want. And um, so, you know, there, there's quite a number of these things and they do affect people in very similar ways. But you have, yeah, if you're eating different plant toxins, you'll get different toxicities and you get different low grade levels of exposure. You know, you can get a different constellation of symptoms. And you just may not have any idea what's going mm -hmm. on with you. But the one thing is if you go on a pure elimination diet, you just get rid of all these toxins. A lot of things just go away. Then your insulin resistance comes down, your insulin comes down, your blood sugar comes down, all these other hormones get balanced out and you feel a lot better and you do a lot better. And objectively, you are a lot better as well. And then, yes, yeah, some people will respond more specifically with like autoimmune issues. So that seems to be somewhat genetic where people have a genetic predisposition for these autoimmune um this autoimmune dysregulation it's not even a dysregulation it's just this autoimmune function and action um and so they have to be very very careful i mean i could if i ate some plants i would, I would feel like garbage but i you know i wouldn't get crohn's disease i wouldn't have bloody diarrhea 30 times a day for four days before you know I, it slowed down if i you know, went on steroids or something like that um you know like corticosteroids like uh, hydrocortisone right so if um if you're in that position, yes, you're going to be much more sensitive. So there are genetic predispositions and then these environmental triggers are much more serious, but some of these things will just physiologically damage you. And, uh, you know, like cyanide will just kill anybody at a certain point. And uh, as little as 50 milligrams of uh, cyanide can kill a 100 kilo adult, right? So it's uh, the you know, sort of a range of lethal dose and cyanide is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram to 3.5 milligrams per kilogram. So it's, it's, a, it's a wide range, but for a hundred kilo man, like my size, it could be as little as 50, 50 uh, milligrams, right? Well, one serving of flaxseed has six milligrams of cyanide in it, right? So like, you know, and, and people just yum this stuff up and they give it to kids because it's so good for you. You know, like a 50 kilo woman, 25, 25 uh, milligrams could kill you, right? What about a 20 kilo um, youth or a 10 kilo kid, right? Five, ki five milligrams could kill them. And you give them a green smoothie with uh, six milligrams of cyanide in it with flaxseed, or maybe you add some almond milk because how good is that? There's more cyanide in that. And then a whole apple where the seed has cyanide in it too. Like you could, you could actually kill somebody doing that. Um, and of course you're trying to do the right thing for your kid. You're trying to make them this green, healthy smoothie. Oh, it's so great for them with flaxseed. Oh, isn't that amazing? I'm such a you know great parent. And then you've caused serious permanent damage to the child and potentially even killed them. So this is something that we have to know, you know, you know people say, well, you know, yes, there's poisons in plants, but dose makes the poison. It's like, right. So what's the poison and what's the dose? If you don't know that, if someone says dose makes the poison, but they can't tell you the dose and they can't even tell you the poison that's in there. They're talking out of their ass and they need to, you know, they, they need to, you know, stop saying that because that's misinformation. It's, um, and it's very dangerous misinformation because there are toxins in these plants. They do have a specific dose that is lethal and that sub lethal doses, it can still cause significant harm that over time can build up and manifest into specific serious chronic diseases that are sometimes irreversible. Is meat hard to digest? No. No, absolutely not. No, we're we're built for eating meat. So we've been eating meat for exactly as long as as humans as we've been breathing air and drinking water. We are perfectly adapted to it. As long as you're not eating all these other stuff, it's the plants that actually slow down your digestion. Fiber can actually block out 30% of uh, absorption of the food that you're eating and you can't absorb it at all. So you can't break down fiber at all you know, 95% or so of plants are fiber. So you can't, you can't break down and digest and absorb 95% of the plants that we eat, you know, if we're eating, eating whole, whole food plants, right? So, and that fiber can block absorption of actually bioavailable foods in the plant and in um, animal tissue. And then there are, are anti-nutrients in plants as well that you know, tannins, oxalates, phytates, these things that bind and, and block out um, uh, certain nutrients so we can't absorb them and we can't get gain nutrition from them or they can get in our bloodstream and actually strip out nutrients. And so there was a study in, um, in humans back in the 1950s 
where they gave people a bunch of spinach because there's a lot of calcium in spinach. They said, oh, okay, well, maybe this is a good source of spinach. See how it goes. They gave people the spinach and actually their calcium levels went down. And that's because the calcium was not bioavailable. It was bound up in ways that we couldn't access. That's another way plants defend themselves is by making their nutrients unavailable to us, like cellulose. No animal has cellulase, which is the enzyme that breaks down cellulose. microorganisms in their gut that make cellulase and eat the fiber and then produce as a result saturated fat and proteins and that's what the animal mm -hmm. absorbs so they hide their calcium as well and then there's oxalates in spinach uh, also and so those oxalates get in your bloodstream and actually strip out the calcium so our calcium levels go down um, then there's things like protease inhibitors that will block our enzyme protease from our pancreas that tries to break down proteins and now we can't break down proteins we can't absorb them and they just go out the other end. So as long as you're not eating plants, you are perfectly designed to liquefy and absorb all the meat that you eat. And in fact, you'll absorb 98 to 99% of the meat that you eat as long as you're not eating it with plants. And we actually see, saw this in studies with children as, as weaning kids onto, their, onto meat for the first time. They found in the 50s that you, they would eat, um, if they were eating meat, they could absorb up to 98% of the meat as their first food. So this is something that we're, we're automatically designed to eat. It's, it's much more easy. It's very bioavailable and we don't need any, any tricks or anything like that, like a cow does in order to ferment and break it down and get these nutrients. It's very, very bioavailable. How is meat digested and absorbed in a human body? Um, so, I mean, there's a, there's a process. So it starts in our stomach and we have a very low stomach pH. That's something typical in, um, in carnivores and uh, scavengers you know, that scavenge meat. So like vultures would have a pH of their stomach around 1.5. Uh, lions will have a pH of about two. Ours is in the middle, it's between 1.5 and two. So uh, we were scavengers for a long time because we, we weren't apex predators for millions of years of eating meat. And it wasn't until we developed tools and our brains and fire and all these other sorts of things that could sort of gave us mastery over natural world that we were able to become apex predators and um and so we have a very low stomach ph because of that so our stomach ph starts breaking things down our liver makes bile gallbladder stores it and that's secreted to then emulsify fat after it's broken down by lipase so we have different enzymes in our pancreas that are perfectly designed to break down the tissues of of uh, meat and sort of break down the fat break down the protein, and then bile emulsifies that. We absorb that in our small intestine. Our, our body works really hard. There's five organs there all working in concert just to absorb fat. And we're saying, no, 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 fat's really bad. You don't want fat. Well, then why are we working so hard just to absorb fat? That doesn't make any sense. Um, well, you don't want too much. What is too much? You know, Because your body can only absorb a certain amount. Once you run out of bile, you really can't absorb fat. It's, it's physiologically impossible to eat too much fat because... Well, you can eat it, but it's just going to go out the other end because you won't absorb it if you if you have if you don't have enough bile. It's just gonna it's just gonna go out. You could take some ox bile if you wanted to be silly and force yourself to absorb more than your body wanted, but that's really the only way. You wouldn't do it physiologically. Um, and then yeah, and then the protease breaks this stuff down. You just absorb it. You absorb it very very easily. It's liquefied and absorbed in our small intestine. It doesn't even make it to our large intestine. Then it goes to a lot what little left goes out. Usually the gristle and the tough connective tissue gets out into the, the, the lower intestine or the colon. And, um, you know, then it's just sort of food for the bacteria down there. And, um, and very little comes out, you know, it's, it's, you're absorbing the vast majority of the food that you're eating, which is a good sign that, uh, if you're eating a natural food and you're absorbing nearly all of that natural food, that's a safe bet that we're, we're biologically adapted and adept at breaking down and absorbing that food. And it has every nutrient and every macro and micro in that we need in the proportion that we need it. And that's also a very good sign that this is what we're supposed to eat. On the topic of fat, what about people who don't have a gallbladder? Yeah, so they don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they are carnivore. It's just that, you know, they've had, uh, they've had some damage to their body. So, if you don't have a gallbladder, you just don't store the bile, but your, your liver still makes it. So it's your liver that makes the bile. And so, and that just stores in the gallbladder and can actually concentrate up to up to 20 times more concentrated. And that's because, you know, if you're not, 
if you're not getting enough uh, food or meat, you know, it's very typical for predators to go, you know, many days or longer without uh, getting, getting food. So when you do get that food, you need to make up for it. You need to be able to eat a lot and absorb a lot. Because again, you don't absorb fat without bile past a certain point. There's, you know, without bile, you can absorb, absorb a small amount, but it's, it's very, very small. It's, uh, it's almost all of it comes out after that. A very small amount comes uh, is able to absorb. It's mostly like MCTs, medium chain triglycerides. So without a gallbladder, you'll just drip bile into your small intestine. And so you can still eat eat fat. You just may have to split up the fat that you eat throughout the day. You'll still need the same amount of fat based mm -hmm. on the amount of bile that you're making, but you'll just need to split it up throughout the day. So you just sort of eat smaller fatty meals, you know, five times a day sort of thing. Try to try to do that. See what your body wants you to do. If you have a lot more fat than your body can absorb, you'll just get diarrhea. That's it. You know, you'll just you'll just get loose stools, and uh, that's showing that. You're just not absorbing a lot of that fat and that fat's coming out in liquid form. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people form what's called a pseudo gallbladder though, which is just an outpouching of the common bile duct. And it works basically exactly the same as a gallbladder does. And so a lot of people actually do form that. And so most people will be able to still eat, uh, you know, big, big meal, big fatty meals of meat uh, without an issue, even without a gallbladder. Mm -hmm. So temperature and meat are ways of cooking meat and meat. Is meat healthier if you say boil it instead of frying it on a pan? Um, I don't necessarily think so. I mean, it, it's, uh, if you're, it depends on the pan you're cooking it on. If you're doing like a, you know, like a nonstick Teflon pan, and we know those have, you know, chemicals that get into the food that you don't want. So, but if you're using like cast iron pan or something like that, um, or like a, a grill that doesn't have any sort of weird chemicals on it or something like that. I don't think there's any, any um, necessarily any benefit from, from boiling it versus, you know, frying it or grilling it. Some people will say, well, you get these, um, you know, different chemicals that, that happen when you're sort of, you know, searing the meat and uh, that can be carcinogenic, but you know, the studies were really not convincing. They were you know, smaller studies on, on animals that used, you know, tens of thousands of times more of these chemicals than you than you'd get from um you know burning the hell out of your meat and um you know and it was done in animals and it wasn't done in a rigorous fashion it wasn't really designed in a, in a very good way and it was using thousands and thousands and thousands of times more than you'd ever sort of experience uh in, in a barbecue um so you know you can't really take too much away from that but one thing that we do know is that humans have been cooking meat for at least 800,000 years. In fact, it, it, we think that we've been using like things that were sort of akin to like a, like a stone oven uh, 800,000 years ago, right? And that people may have been actually cooking 1.5 to 2 million years ago um, because the Homo habilis actually went up into the ice when the ice sheets were coming down, that's pretty hard to do without fire. So some archaeologists and paleoanthropologists think that uh, we had fire as far back as, as then, because otherwise, if you're not able to control your, your body heat um, and, and keep warm in an ice age, you know, that's not, uh, this is a bit reckless to go running into an ice age, you know, to go into the ice drift, you know, but you know, you'd have furs and things like that too. So who knows? But um it's, um, but it, it, at least 800,000 years we've been cooking meat, at least. That's half a million years before Homo sapiens uh, after e even existed by the earliest estimate. Mm -hmm. And some people think it was 100,000 years ago. Some people say as much as 300,000 years ago, uh, but it certainly wasn't 800,000 years ago. And so half a million years, at least half a million years before Homo sapiens even existed, our ancestors have been cooking meat. So whatever happens when you're cooking meat over an open fire, we're well used to. And again, it's about the, the, the laws of adaptation, laws of biology is adaptation. If it were extremely bad for us to cook meat and have those little burnt crispy bits, then, you know, we probably, we would have had to adapt to that or we wouldn't have been as successful. And since we were successful, we have obviously adapted to it or it hasn't actually caused all that much of a problem. So mm -hmm. whatever happens when we cook meat, we've been cooking meat for a long time. We're well used to it. So I don't worry too much about it. Okay. 
So since I have you on the podcast, I thought that mm -hmm. I might be able to pick your brain on some of my own issues. So they would be yeah. neurological. And so um, my story is I went on the carnival diet and I felt really good. But then I was told by a doctor that it's not possible. And I was given an injection of a CGRP monoclonal antibody for migraine. So she actually switched my drugs mm -hmm. because I was already on them. And uh, that caused what they called inflammatory complications. Basically, I spent a year in bed. I was blindfolded. Mm. I couldn't walk. And um, it was really bad. And um, I recovered like 80%, I would say. However, I still have this trigeminal nerve pain, which is causing light mm. sensitivity. And it is not for like the regular light, but for artificial lights and this is one thing that this diet wasn't able to fix so i was wondering if mm. there is any thoughts that you have on that um i can go into like the mechanism of how those yeah. cgrp and what those side effects were about uh but yeah this is basically my question <laughs> well it's um it, it's one of those things that you know a lot of a lot of what you know eating a carnivore diet does is just get all the the roadblocks out of the way to let your body heal itself yeah. and and stop from you know causing more damage and also to to get out of the way so your body can get on with things you know that that's um you can actually you can get injured you can get injured from medication or surgery or other sorts of uh, other sorts of exposures plants and otherwise and that can cause damage and that can cause permanent damage and sometimes that that damage isn't uh, possible for the body to heal but sometimes it's slow going neurological damage is very slow to heal so it's it's hard to say what will happen it's one of those things that you just sort of have to hope for the best and see but um certainly traditional causes of trigeminal neuralgia i've seen significantly help it sounds like yours is a specific injury from this uh from this medication so just sort of have to see if that's that damage is going to heal you know you could you could try and consider um you know different sorts of treatments like you know rhizotomies where you just sort of give a little electric current and just sort of you know fray that nerve and and deaden it and uh, and that can at least lower the expression and signal of pain yeah back i don't have neuralgia nerve. it's like it's constant just inflammation and there is nothing on the yeah. mri Okay. So what, what, what symptoms are you experiencing? Uh, well, light sensitivity to artificial lights. That's it. So like what happens when light gets on it? Does it hurt or what? Yes. It's like a throbbing pain. Sometimes it feels like it sucks, like it pulls on that nerve and mm. eventually it's going to cause some pain, but it's not neuralgia. It's not that horrible and it's going to trigger a migraine. So this is what happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, it, it could very well respond to like a rhizotomy but it's hard to say because you know you had sort of a specific medication that seemed to have triggered this off so it's hard to say if that will respond it might be worth a shot but uh, how long have you been doing carnivore now again uh like four years keto three years carnivore okay. lion diet so never good. cheating <laughs> yeah perfect well you know hope you know i would hope for the best and hope that it, it gets better um yeah. it may be one of those things that you sort of have you know, permanent damage from this and it may linger around. And so, you know, thinking about the other sort of treatments that we have, the more traditional treatments um, yeah. For, yeah. for reducing those symptoms might be worth it. And unless it's not as big of a, of a deal for you, if it's, um, if it's just sort of annoying, but not horrible, then, you know, maybe something you can live with. Otherwise you can think about those sorts of treatments. Yeah. I was thinking about stem cells. Hmm. Always try it. I mean, those, those not going to have, too much data on that yet especially for i don't i don't know how if there's any really on the trigeminal neuralgia but it's um you know it's uh, and it's probably expensive to the point that it's uh, without any sort of evidence it might be uh, hard to justify that but mm -hmm. um you know there, i mean there are treatments for trigeminal neuralgia that you know we have and that you can always you just sort of buzz it with that rhizotomy you just sort of yeah. buzz that little trigeminal nerve and it can just dampen down the signal going back down that that uh, branch of the trigeminal nerve and that can that can significantly help people mm -hmm. okay thank you um so something that i would like to finish off with so i heard you make amazing steaks apparently mm -hmm. so i was wondering yeah. how to make a perfect steak well the the way to make a be the best steak is in the 
the the lead up to cooking it. So you want to age it in certain ways. So if you have it like a ribeye loin um, or you know New York strip or whatever whatever you're going to have, you have the whole thing in the cryovac straight from the store. Um, you put that in the refrigerator and you leave it there for a month. That's called wet aging. So some of the nicer steakhouses, they'll say 30 day wet age, 30 day dry age. Mm -hmm. So that's the wet aging part is keeping in that cryovac and putting it in the refrigerator and you just leave it alone. And it just sort of breaks it down, becomes more tender. And then you open it up, dry it off, and then you cut it up into your own steaks. I do very big steaks, sort of like big three inch thick cut steaks. And so I try to have something that's big enough that I can just have one of those things and that's good for a day, you know, or if I'm working out a lot, I might have one and a half or two. And so then what I do, I don't do like the whole traditional dry age where I'll let the whole, the whole loin just sort of sit there in the fridge and, and dry out. I'll cut it up into steaks. And, um, and then if you want to salt, you can salt. I don't really use salt anymore, but you put it on, on wire racks on a baking sheet. And, uh, and then you set those steaks out. And if you want to, if you, if you use salt, then you should salt at this point. So then it soaks in, helps dry it out a bit more and the salt goes all the way through it. So it sort of perfectly salts, uh, every bite. And so you do that and you put it on the, the drying rack and you can't have it touching. So all these things have to be separate. You want air to circulate around every surface and, uh, that's to dry it out. And if it dries out, then it'll stay fresh. It won't, it won't rot. You know, that's how we disinfect our hands in the hospital with alcohol is mm -hmm. it's not the alcohol that's killing the bugs. It's that it dries it out and it dehydrates it very quickly. And that kills all the bugs. So you want, you want it dry. If it's a point of moisture, then that's somewhere the bacteria can live. So you leave it there, you let it dry out and you just put it in the refrigerator at least overnight, usually at least three days. And for those big thick steaks, I usually like doing five to seven days or maybe even a bit longer. Either way, when you're ready, you know, every couple of days you can sort of flip them over as well to get a more even, mm -hmm. even dryness. But this takes out a lot of the excess water. This concentrates the flavor. It browns a lot better. And so you take a, a cast iron pan. You can do this on the grill too, but, you know, a cast iron pan is really nice. And you put a decent amount of tallow, like a, like a half an inch or a centimeter of tallow or duck fat or lard or some sort of animal fat, grass fed ghee, that sort of thing. I wouldn't use butter because it has too low of a smoke point. It'll smoke up real, mm -hmm. uh, really easily. So use one of those fats and get the, the pan, you know, fairly hot. And, um, then you want to sear all the edges because again, if it's three inches thick, you want to sort of, yeah. you know, cook on the, all the outside bits, get all those crispy and brown, and then you cook it on each side. If you've let it come up to room temperature, which can take all bloody day, then it um, then it has a different cooking time if you pull it straight out of the refrigerator. So depending on your stove, depending on that, how hot you're cooking it, you, you may cook it for different times. I know the different timings of things on how I like it to get it. I usually get it pretty rare, rare to medium rare at most, uh, but I like it more on the rare side. So I like it seared on the outside and more rare on the inside. And it gets this nice brown, beautiful crackly crust and it's perfectly salted all the way through however you want to salt it and then you let it sit out and you let it rest and for at least 10 minutes and then you cut it up and you have it and it's it's absolutely amazing how, how you have these sorts of things are absolutely fantastic everybody has had these you know they like, have like a you know, the different uh, doctors from my department will come over and we'll, or we'll all have like a steak out or something like that. And I'll make these steaks. And then some of them are eating them. They're like, oh my God, you eat this every day? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, it's just like, it's like, no wonder this is all you eat. I wouldn't eat anything else either. Like, Jesus. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, people, you know, people eat that and they're like, oh my God, you know, and they're, they're saying, they're like, well, no wonder you don't go out to eat. Like, why would you, you know, you make better steaks than any steakhouse. We went to a steakhouse, a really nice steakhouse here in, in Perth uh, with our, our department. And um, most people there had, had my steaks and, you know, a couple of them hadn't. And so uh, we were had and we had these really nice aged, like super expensive steaks. Right. And, um, and so one of the, one of the guys who hadn't had my steaks, he said, 
he asked them, is this like, oh, okay, so, you know, who makes better steaks? You know, is it, is it Chafee or are these, are these better than Chafee's or what? And they're like, oh no, Chafee's like, no one, no <laughs> one makes better steaks than Chafee does, you know? So that seems to be it, you know, just letting that wet age then dry age, but really it's that salting them, putting it on a rack and letting it sit and dry out. That makes a world of difference. Even if you just do that overnight, it mm -hmm. makes a massive difference. I do that for all meat now, fish, chicken, anything, I'll at least, uh, you know, salt it, put it in overnight. Uh, in the refrigerator. It just dries it out a bit, helps it cook better, concentrates the flavor. It makes a massive difference. It's night and day. Mm. Okay. So Dr. Chafee, where can people find you? Yeah. So um, my social media, my main one is um, Instagram. That's just Anthony Chafee MD. And so that's A-C-H-A-F-F-E-E. -E. And my YouTube's the same, just Anthony Chafee MD. And then I have, you know, Twitter or X, that's Anthony underscore Chafee. And then my, my podcast is just called The Plant Free MD. And, um, and then I have uh, you know, weekly, uh, weekly Zoom sessions and Q&As and things like that with my Patreon group as well, which is uh, in early releases and things like that, which is, um, again, Anthony Chafee MD. And there's other, other social media stuff, but those are the main ones. All right. Thank you very much for coming on. Not a problem. Thank you for having me.